and spinning and we are live what is up wrestling fans we are a few bros wrestling show tonight <laughs> Doug, I, i'm miscounting i thought we were the two bros wrestling show what well, is tonight we are a few bros we, we have a very special guest with us tonight can, can, can we call him diamond david pool can we do works that? for me all right <laughs> ddp <laughs> exactly. <laughs> David Poole is joining us tonight. <laughs> Definitely friend of the show, uh, has sort of been a third man really uh, on a lot of our broadcasts, uh, commenting and, and, and you know, keeping some conversations moving. So uh, lifelong wrestling, wrestling fan and NXT super fan, which makes him a perfect choice for the very first guest we've ever had on the Two Bros Wrestling Show. Because tonight, gentlemen, our main event topic is NXT 2.0. Hopefully you all just got through watching uh, 2.0 before you're catching us on this special Tuesday night, 10 o'clock spot. So let us know uh, in the comments what you think of NXT 2.0 as we go through the discussion. But uh, gentlemen, as we do. Oh, hold on. Hold on. So before we get ready, to that main event. i to have somebody, somebody here. Hold on. <laughs> hold on. Okay, there we go. Wait. Uh, there we go. There we go. So... We'll start off with some programming notes. Major League Baseball is wrecking havoc on the wrestling schedule, not just the Two Bros Wrestling Show, uh, <laughs> but uh, all around professional wrestling. Uh, as you know, last Friday's SmackDown didn't air on Fox, but rather on FS1. Uh, and because of this and the fact that they decided to extend SmackDown by a half hour, making it a, a, a supersized edition, it was the first time that WWE went head to head with AEW uh, when it was one of WWE's main brand shows. And this fact was not lost on Tony Khan, who in advance sent a tweet directed at WWE and Vince McMahon saying, I saw you're doing a half hour head to head with them. I can't wait to finally beat your main show. It's been a long time coming. See you next Friday. And uh, well, the results are in and, and it's, it's mixed. Um, it's a bit of a victory and a bit of a defeat for both of the big brands. Uh, WWE did, of course, beat uh, AEW Rampage in that half hour head to head when it comes to ratings. Uh, overall ratings, they were 31% higher than AEW was. But of course, in that key demo, as AEW tends to do, they eked out a slight advantage in that 30 minutes uh, overlap, uh, beating WWE. So it's a, a win and a loss for both sides. Uh, but to be fair, it's probably worth noting that uh, it, things would have probably been a whole lot different had WWE been on their normal network because Friday SmackDown on FS1 drew around 793,000 or so viewers, uh, which typically uh, go back a week ago and they did 2.1 million on Fox. So normally it wouldn't be nearly as close as it was. Uh, but that just goes to show how important that uh, broadcast home of Fox is to WWE and the numbers that they draw. Uh, AEW, despite the head-to-head -head competition, uh, managed to hold pretty steady to what Rampage is, has been doing the last few weeks. So something interesting to watch moving forward because we have a lot more preemptions coming up. Um, in fact, uh, Dynamite, which was on Wednesday last week, will once again be on, uh, excuse me, instead of Wednesday, they were moved to Saturday. They're going to be on Saturday again next week. And then once again, at the end of this month, SmackDown will move from Fox, slide back over to FS1 on the 29th. So uh, lots of changes because of the, uh, the playoffs and the sports schedules of the various networks. Um, so ticket concerns, let's move on to that. Uh, perhaps the bloom is off the rose a little bit for pro wrestling's return to live touring, or maybe it's just the, you know, the fall and coronavirus that has people a little concerned. Uh, but supposedly tickets are becoming a little bit harder to move for both of the major promotions. Uh, for whatever reason, the attendance at not this past uh, Monday, but the week, uh, week before, last Monday's Raw uh, was supposedly the lowest uh, ticketed gate for Raw since they had returned for live touring. That show was at the Chase Center there in San Francisco, so a major metropolitan area, but that crowd at Raw last Monday night was just barely over 4,000 people. And then for AEW this past week, uh, the uh, edition of Rampage on Friday night 
was live in order to compete head to head with the uh, the super size SmackDown that we just mentioned in our first news item. And supposedly tickets were slow moving for that show there in Miami. So this is something to look at moving forward because there's been a, a, some pretty packed houses as we've moved through the summer and the return to touring. But maybe maybe things might have uh, be tilting back to either more normals or maybe people being just extra cautious. Moving on to some personnel news. Uh, Peyton Royce and Billy Kay, formerly known as the Iconics in WWE, are coming to Impact Wrestling under the name The Inspiration. They're going to debut uh, this uh, Saturday night at the Bound for Glory pay-per-view of TNA. It's a big get for Impact, as many probably expected these two high-profile talents to end up on either AEW or, or you know, perhaps uh, New Japan or someplace. But uh, uh, good, uh, good pickup um, for Impact. And really, when I thought about it, this makes sense. Um, for as good as AEW and WWE are with their women's division, uh, both of the big promotion are kind of lacking on female tag teams or natural female tag teams, whereas Impact actually has a, a great uh, job that they've done bolstering an actual tag team division in the women's ranks. You have uh, Rosemary and Havoc, who are the current tag team champions there. Uh, you have Tasha Stills and uh, Savannah Evans, who are sort of a power, uh, you know, a, 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 a team on the rise. Uh, Jordan Grace, Rachel Ellering, they're sort of uh, a female road warriors, if you will. And then uh, you got Sue Young's Undead Brides and uh, Kimberly and Brandy Lauren. And then you have the Influence, which are uh, the veteran team of Tamil Dashwood and Madison Rain. So that's way more tag teams in the women's division than you're going to see on either WWE or AEW, which makes uh, for the inspiration. That's going to take some getting used to. It makes kind of a perfect fit uh, for them to join Impact. Uh, just so that they can have some teams to work with. Uh, NXT this week, NXT UK rather this week, had fans back for the first time uh, since the pandemic started. So during the pandemic, the show moved into a studio format instead of an arena format. And now they have fans in that studio. So this is the first time that the fans have been in BT Sports Studios. And as with all the other promotions, guys, that we've seen throughout the summer, as people have come back online with an actual audience, it definitely enhanced uh, the production that night and the show overall in general, having that energy back in the uh, in the uh, in the broadcast. Um, moving on, drama in Dudleyville. So during an appearance this week on a podcast, Devon Dudley mentioned that he and Bubba Ray are no longer business partners. Devon revealed that the two don't even speak very often, and after several decades of pretty much being t attached at the, at the hip with some tag team dominance and then as r runners of a pro wrestling school together, uh, apparently uh, there's been a bit of a falling out. Devon mentioned that it all began when the two men parted ways back in 2016 when they left WWE as an active uh, team. At that time, apparently they were offered a t uh, contract. Uh, Bubba... Uh, or Bully Ray, as it were now, uh, did not care for the terms of the contract, did not like the positioning to put over the younger talent, decided that they, they, he didn't want to do the contract extension. Devon stayed on and now currently works as an agent backstage, and pretty much that was the end of the two's relationship. And uh, apparently even their wrestling school, they now have separate wrestling schools that they're running individually instead of their uh, Dudleyville school that they were running together. And there's probably another side of this story because in a since deleted tweet, Velvet Sky, who is the real life fiance of Bully Ray, uh, pretty much tweeted that this was all fiction and that there was another side. And then, of course, that was taken down. So drama there. Stay tuned. Um, Moving on, CM Punk isn't the only member of his household to make a return to the world of professional wrestling. Uh, Punk's wife, AJ Lee, uh, as her ring name was known, has been tabbed as a backstage producer and writer for the Women of Wrestling promotion, which is rebooting after the pandemic. And so uh, apparently at Punk's urging, he uh, got his wife uh, to consider the offer, and she's now going to mentor backstage and do producing and help the talent along and hopefully help the women of wrestling promotion uh, because uh, the first season was eh, just so-so. Let's see where it goes. They do have Tessa Blanchard, which is a big plus for any uh, promotion out there. <laughs> Isn't really a plus. I mean, I mean yeah. Tessa's great. Don't get me wrong, but I mean. On screen, her... yes. Behind the scenes. <laughs> right? right. Although I do love her, like, uh, what was it, her new shirt on uh, PWT? Uh, the the nuclear shirt that she's getting all, all the legit heat for <laughs> for her heat. So uh, make that money, Tessa. 
Uh, and we'll end with this. Uh, I'll end with a new segment with this. Crown Jewel is this Thursday at noon. Uh, this one has been positioned a little different than the Crown Jewels in the past. These are, you know, this is definitely a more consequential card. Uh, they have kept it as the only um, major card for the month. There's not an opposing pay-per-view as there normally is in the same month as Crown Jewel. So this, by default, is your October big event from WWE. And they have truly stacked the lineup with WrestleMania, SummerSlam, Royal Rumbles, you know, level uh, matches. Um, you know, the interesting thing with these controversial events, of course, is where they take place and the time of day. The fact that in the past they've been rather inconsequential house showed, uh, supersized house shows in front of an audience that doesn't know the product and therefore doesn't necessarily always respond in the way that WWE would hope that uh, those in attendance would be responding. So it will be worth watching to see how this one may differ. Uh, in terms of tone and crowd response and whether or not there's anything uh, memorable that comes out of it, because truly to date, the only thing memorable I can think coming out of a crown uh, jewel was uh, Titus O'Neil falling and sliding underneath the ring <laughs> in that first one. Um, but we'll have full coverage. We'll, we'll do a recap next week on our show on Sunday night and let you know everything that happened at crown jewel. And with that, gentlemen, and I say gentlemen because normally there is no other gentleman here but myself. So, uh, sorry. But you know you're going to be – now it's a two-on-one. That's all right. <laughs> it's all good. I'm, I'm slightly into the weather and just maybe a little bit symptomatic right now. So I'm a little bit hopped up on medication, which it seems like I always am on this show anymore. <laughs> There's always some sort of micro health event or something going on in my life, but – Either that or you have a problem you're trying to hide from uh, everyone by masking it. Under <laughs> we have a comment. That name sounds familiar. Hey, I've, I've got my fuzzy blanket I'm covered up with. You know, I'm cold tonight. <laughs> Let's get to this main event. <laughs> we are talking NXT 2.0. And I know that, David, you were a diehard NXT fan from the beginning. Doug and I are. Most of you all watching at home probably are as well. We're going to talk. We gave them a month, a month into 2.0 in this room. So I'd like to kick off this discussion before we get into whether or not we think it's necessary, what we think of some of the uh, talent we're seeing on the screen. I want to talk about presentation. I know that that can be a small thing, but it really can enhance or detract. This was the yellow and black brand. So now I guess we're the pink and fuchsia and green and blue and yellow and pretty much all the colors brand right now. So what do you all think of the, the logo, the color scheme? I've, I've seen some, quite a few, quite a few comments saying that it looks like something that should be on a Nickelodeon game show. Um, <laughs> Love that. It, it, it's definitely, it's definitely an adjustment. Um, I do like though, that it's, it's different than any other promotion out there right now. I mean, at least it sets itself apart, but yeah, it's, it's definitely going to take some getting used to. Doug, what do you think? Well, yeah, I don't like it, man. Stuff. Yeah, I, I like that 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 Triple H inspired heavy metal aesthetic that was, you know, this NXT that I fell in love with. I, I don't mind a, a, a splash of color, but that this unicorn puke that is like the new NXT I, I, 2.0, I'm not feeling it. But again, maybe that's just the grumpy old man in me, or like leaning towards my heavy metal, like 14 year old side. I don't know, but I like that older older aesthetic where everything was kind of like dark and gritty, and but I'm glad you say the dark and gritty because I, I am not necessarily a fan of the logo change, uh, but I do like the lightening up. I, I like the way that they have chose to uh, enhance the performance center. I know it's a studio show and I did kind of like the dark look, but having the crowd fully lit, even though it's not a, you know, it's not a small looking crowd like you have sometimes with like, uh, you know, the, the NWA show, but it's, it reminds me more of like a, uh, I, I guess an old WCW Saturday night that they used to do at like Disney studios or something. It, it, it looks energetic and I, I like being able to see the crowd. Do you all have any opinion on, on the way that they light the show? I, I like the crowd. Um, I, I kind of like that it seems that the, the walls all around the arena are kind of a screen. So even though we may not like the colors, it seems like they can change those colors at will. I mean, they do that for the intros. So, I mean, if it comes to the point where maybe those those colors are just an absolute failure, they can always change them, and it, it'll be an easy fix. 
So yeah. what, what I was watching tonight, I, I was just thinking, this is kind of look it, the whole the whole setup kind of reminds me of like a high school prep rally now. Like everybody's everybody's crammed into the gym, you know. They've got like the the color the spray of colors going on, and it's just like kind of like a pep rally atmosphere to me. I but think again, maybe. Jared called it out good here that it's uh, more like a TRL kind of look. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, they are going for that younger demo. So, and and, the, and if is it just me or does it also look like they're using a higher camera angle in the presentation as well? They're kind of almost doing like a high instead of like a hard camera, it's a high camera that sort of pans from side to side. Yeah, mm -hmm. a little bit and. You know, I actually kind of like that, too. I was a little worried about how the production was going to come across because, as we know, there's been a lot of layoffs uh, that went along with this reboot. And so most of those were on the production side. And I was afraid that it would maybe look like a cheaper production. But other than some, you know, disagreement on the logo, I'm actually a, a little bit impressed with uh, the, what they're doing with obviously a whole lot less people. Absolutely. Let's move on then to what we all want to talk about is was this even necessary? It, you know, the whole thing of if it's not broke, uh, why fix it? Presentation is important. And, you know, every now and then we'll, you'll see Raw and SmackDown change their, their look, their logo, their entrance music, all that. But to do an entire reboot like this, um, this is kind of where I want to start with more of the meat of the subject. First and foremost, was this reboot necessary in your minds? Doug, we'll start with you. What do you think? I, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I'm not I'm not sure why why there was a reboot. I mean, surely it wasn't a knee jerk reaction to losing this fictional Wednesday Night War that, that was going on there briefly. But yeah, I, I don't think it was necessary. They could continue doing what they were doing unless they were totally pulling the wrong demo and are trying to rebrand to pull a younger demo. But I don't think that's really working for them either because I saw a story this week where their the median age for their the demos they've been pulling is the median age of their viewers are 62 years old, and I think they're trying to shoot much much lower than 62. But they you you've been an uh, NXT fan from the beginning. You've uh, attended a takeover and all of that. I know that that was your favorite promotion to follow. Um, do you think that that a 2.0 was uh, warranted at this point in time? You, you guys are probably going to be a little surprised at my answer because. I I have been a huge NXT fan for a very long time, and I think my opinion, along with the opinion of most hardcore wrestling fans, is that NXT was the best show that WWE had to offer. We'll call it NXT 1.0 was the best that they had to offer. But I don't think it was really catching on with the casual fan, with the mainstream fan. I mean, us hardcore fans love it, but it was still the lowest rated show of all three. So... As much as I loved NXT, the original NXT, I do think something like this probably was necessary because I think this new vision is to create their own homegrown talent as opposed to just bringing in all these guys from other promotions. I actually think as great as NXT was, it was never really a product that was representative of what WWE was trying to sell. I feel like it was it was WWE's version of indie wrestling. It was their version of Ring of Honor. It was their version of, of New Japan. Um, they it was a project to see if they could have their own kind of show like those shows, and and they did it and they did it successfully. But I don't think Vince McMahon was ever happy with it because he wasn't creating his own talent. So I think it brings up an interesting point, and you know, to me, no, it wasn't broken. Uh, it didn't need fixed and probably it was doomed the second they took it off the WWE network and put it on USA because then those ratings become to matter. And then Vince McMahon pays attention to those sorts of things. And USA certainly pays attention to those sorts of things. But it, to me, it's a question of identity. You know, what does NXT want to be? What is it meant to be? When it started out, it was your developmental program. It was the pipeline to get guys ready. It was a training school slash TV show to get guys ready for the main roster. Then they began to, you know, for the sake of, of buzz and attendance as they were live touring, they started bringing in this indie talent. And Triple H began referring to it as we're not just a promote promotion that is here to make the stars of tomorrow. We're our own brand. We're a third brand. But really, they were somewhere in between both of those things. They were neither fish nor fowl. They were a training school 
They were the performance center, but they had all this indie talent that obviously they started to collect a lot of, of guys who we love, but who were never going to go to Raw or SmackDown. They were not meant to be taking that next step to the, the other brands. Uh, Vince McMahon, for either size reasons, age reasons, all of the above reasons, there's a lot of guys, your Bobby Fishes, your, you know, Johnny Gargano's, these guys probably, Adam Cole, you saw what happened. Adam leaves out frustration after how many years of him supposedly getting ready to take that next next step. Um, I understand why they would go back to the idea of, even though fans love it, it's a critical success. We're draw, going to draw about the same ratings, whether we pay a lot of money to stockpile individuals we're never going to use on Raw or SmackDown or, or ever going to see the, the you know, the ring at a WrestleMania. And I also, I just feel like all these guys that they've lost and might lose eventually in the future, they might be under WWE contract, but I don't think that they'll ever truly be WWE guys. They're, they're indie guys who are collecting a WWE paycheck. And I think McMahon wants guys that are going to be true WWE guys that start with WWE and, and hopefully spend their careers with WWE. He wants more more Roman Reigns, where you know they 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 bleed WWE. I can totally see that, especially with with what they are doing with NXT now, because they we've got still a mix of the veteran indie guys like Gargano and Ciampa mixed in with you know all this new fresh uh, fresh faces and are are working to elevate them. I think it's almost like just like a cutover point at this. At this at this stage, where we have those indie guys that we love, like you're talking about, who are never really going to be WWE guys. I mean, Ciampa and Gargano went to the main roster for like you know a cup of coffee, as Cameron would say, and that didn't really work out for them. They're back in NXT. They'll probably stay in NXT or in end up leaving New Japan, AEW, you know, Impact at some point in the future because we're going to see more and more talent trying to grow and, and come up through there. I totally agree with that, that that's, that's the plan for this version of NXT. And they want something like, they want something like OVW back at like 15 years ago when they were creating, you know, Brock Lesnar and Batista and Randy Orton and John Cena, like that's what he wants to do all over. And that's yeah. where I get to the point of identity. If that's what it was intended to be originally. And they strayed away from that much to our delight, perhaps, but if they strayed away from that and can strip it back, and save all that money by letting all that talent go and still draw the same rating. If you were running a business, you can, from a business standpoint, understand what they're trying to do. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit. I hadn't planned on it, but before we get to the, the, some of the young talent I want to talk about, because Doug brought them up. If you were some of that remaining uh, talent, your uh, Tommaso Ciampa's, your Roderick Strong's, um, would you be, uh, you, you know, feeling pretty confident right now, or would you be looking at the end date of your contract and wondering uh, if uh, Tony still has your number? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you think these guys are going to be used to just eventually get over these young guys? In that kind of absolutely. Way? Yeah. I, yeah. I I don't necessarily think they'll get fired, but I think I think. Guys like Champa and Strong, as great as they are, they don't really fit the vision that I think McMahon has for this product. And and who knows, some of these guys might be counting down the days anyway until they can go to a place like AEW or Impact. Because if if you if you want to be part of that ind independent wrestling scene, that's where you need to go. Probably WWE isn't the place for you. True. I mean, for so many years, it was that's the that's the mecca. That's where you want to be. But now you see people actively trying to get out of their contracts because there's so many other opportunities elsewhere. Well, truthfully, Doug, as, as, as you and I have talked so many times on this show, uh, if you're working indie dates and you got a name for yourself, you oftentimes can set your own schedule and make every bit as much money as you have on a developmental contract, especially. And, and here's the thing, Rand, like right now, I mean, any of those guys, if they get cut, you know, right after NXT went off the air tonight, you know, Kyle O'Reilly, Ciampa, <laughs> Gargano, you know, Roderick Strong, if these guys get cut, you know, 30 days from now, they're showing up somewhere else. You know, they're going to do indie dates. They're showing up on Impact, Ring of Honor, New Japan, AEW, if it's just a one-shot deal. You know, there are so many options at this point in the world of wrestling I mean, we're not out of a global pandemic just yet, but you know, we're I think we're closer now than we have been to getting 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 back to normal. 
so i mean you know indie dates are going to start popping up live events are going to keep coming back as long as we're sensible about it and everything so it, there's options for these guys right now what three years ago when some of these people entered their contracts there were there there was really no other game in town you know Bobby Fish just uh, headlined uh, AEW's Friday Night Show. Bobby Fish, who I love as a talent, but probably was the least charismatic or known of of you know his entire group there in NXT. So those that remain obviously uh, have to look at that and go, yeah, there's there's definitely greener pastures here because um, it kind of goes back to what, one of the stories we were talking about in the news about you know. The, the whole Dudley boys scenario, Bubba didn't want to put over the young guys as, as that, you know, if you sign this contract extension, that's what we're using you for. And that I think is what you're going to see, uh, particularly as we keep moving forward, maybe as soon as next week, but we're going to get into that here in a second. Yeah. Um, let's talk talent. Uh, we have a lot of new faces in a very short period of time. So uh, Doug, I'll start with you. Who is it that's standing out uh, to you? And one caveat, you can't say Braun Breaker. <laughs> I've got nobody there. I've got nobody if I can't go with That's Sonny. the most obvious. Because <laughs> really, <laughs> I want to have a discussion about him in a, in a second. I want to have a whole – he's in a whole category of himself. Is there anyone else that's standing out to you? It, really, nobody else is standing out. Because, you know, I, I'm watching this show, and I'm thinking, you know, the characters on, you know, Heels – are much more engaging and much more I'm uh, much more interested in those characters who are actors playing wrestlers than these wrestlers who have developed characters for me to get you know involved in and you know I, I can't find anybody to attach to other than you know Breaker but we're going to talk about him in a minute stupid <laughs> name still think that so, just so no, is connect, no one else is connecting with you at all I, I, I'm not nobody's really clicking with me right now I mean I Tell the truth. You've only seen one episode. <laughs> I, I did watch the first episode. I've struggled to watch a couple of different episodes. And I didn't make it through like the entire episode tonight, other than, you know, when Champa was on, on air. <laughs> but it is a mean, lot, uh, It's a lot that's being thrown at an audience at the same time to here's, you know, a 20 new folks for you to get used to instead of here's a new person we're bringing in. So from that aspect, it's hard for a lot of these talents to completely stand out from each other because they're all competing for that newbie status of like who rises to the top. Some obviously more than others, which is why I wanted to save him to last. David, how about you? Is there anyone that's uh, impressing you? I got a short list here. I'll get to. Well, I have one, but I kind of to bring him up, I I think I kind of need to mention two. Um, one of them is is Joe Gacy, who's who's been on four or five episodes at least, if not all of them, since since two started. Um. I, I can't really, I mean, I think he's going to be kind of a heel character, but I'm not sure. I mean, he's kind of got this woke, you know, personality about e equality and acceptance and, and inclusion. And it's um, it's one of those characters where he, he says all the right things, but you're not sure if he's really a good guy or, or if he's kind of a nut. Um, I think he's he's got that look in his eyes that makes you think he could come unhinged. So, so I think... Uh, he could be very interesting. I didn't actually know until today that he was uh, part of uh, Combat Zone Wrestling. I've never really watched CZW, but he, he was there for several years, and one of his names there was um, Psycho Joe. So so I'm sure there's another uh, side of him coming. The reason I bring him up is because of the apparent follower that they kind of have been building for him. Um, they haven't actually, on the show named him yet but i know his name is harland uh and he was i actually did not know that harland was uh parker boudreau who i've seen pictures of who, who got a lot of um he got a lot of people saying he was a, a brock lesnar look-alike but, but, yeah but he they changed his look a lot and he is no longer a brock lesnar look-alike but the attire he's wearing right now very much covers his physique because he has got muscles on top of muscles. And I think it'll be interesting if they show that a little bit more than they have so far. So I didn't realize that was Parker Boudreau when I, when I was, see, I was watching that piece tonight. I was thinking my first initial thought when I see when they do the, like that, that rack focus and where he's doing like the whole, like, you know, reach out going old school, Ernest Angley there, <laughs> you know, I would, and then they do the rack focus and you see him. I, I, 
for an instant I thought, is is that Lars Sullivan? <laughs> what is going <laughs> on? <laughs> You know, I actually am. Uh, I had him in my like in between. Like I hadn't made my mind up. I had like a small list of folks I've been impressed with, those that I'm not getting, and he's somewhere in the middle. And that I'm intrigued because Casey looks like he looks like he could be Kevin Steen's uh, younger brother. Uh, he has a gimmick that's somewhere between the cross of what they tried to do back in the day, old school NXT with Juice Robinson at the time, like the stereotypical like uh, uh, liberal character that they're kind of poking fun at mixed with some sort of like Bray Wyatt, like 1.0 uh, Wyatt family style cult leader type. So they, they got a lot of different things smashed into one. So I can't say I'm not interested uh, in, in him. Um, you said you had a, another talent. I guess those are the two, the two that are kind of linked together. Yeah, yeah Harland and, and uh, Joe Gacy. I, Carmel Hayes stands out to me. Um, I think, and I had this in my notes that you know, because Doug knows I I make voluminous amount of notes. I had these notes when I thought this show was going to be on Sunday, so uh, I actually had, uh, put these notes together last week before they gave Carmella the North American Championship. But in my notes, I said Carmella Hayes is the next Shane Strickland, and here they go and put him over Shane Strickland in a swerve uh, to put mm. that title on him. Obviously, the company is uh, high on him, or they wouldn't have let him win the breakout tournament. And then, of course, they take the next step and already have gold on him. Uh, but he has, he's, he has swagger. He's quick in the ring. He's good on the mic. Um, so I expect good things out of him. Um, what do y'all think about like a, Don, a Tony D'Angelo? I know it's a, a very stereotypical gimmick, but he is, they're definitely have played it up with a lot of vignettes, which I kind of like when they introduce a character that way. And he is playing it with conviction. Yeah, absolutely. And and it's, it's you know, it's de- like you said, it's definitely stereotypical, but I feel like he's also pretty good in the ring. And I, I like his, his, his finishing maneuver a lot. Yeah, he's only really had the one match, but he looked good in it. I'm not sure I know who this guy is. It sounds like a Soprano character, though. Forget about it. <laughs> okay. He is playing the most stereotypical Sopranos character you can imagine, though. Okay, so legit is like a Soprano. Oh, yeah. Legit. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> he t- I mean, he knows the guy, and there's like, you know, bodies and trunks, and, you know, the there's the whole thing. But it is, a, though it's an archetype, Vince likes gimmicks. So if nothing else, based on needing to stand out when there's so many people that are kind of in that gray zone of like same ish right now, he stands out and I can see a clear path for him in that Vince will probably really, really like it. <laughs> can I just bring up a couple other guys that I, I kind of had my eye on? I, I have a few myself. Uh, Zion Quinn, I feel has looked uh, really good um, in the ring. I mean, I feel like he's got a look that could definitely be huge and he looks pretty good in the ring. He's a, he's a Samoan guy. So we know Samoans tend to do pretty well <laughs> in wrestling, even though I don't think he's any relation to the bloodline. He's not related to, uh, to the most famous Samoans that we have in the WWE, but there's pretty much Samoans know how to go. So <laughs> uh, I, I really want to see more from him. And I don't know if you guys saw the short vignettes they had for um, Solo Sokoa, who's supposed to be showing up next week. Um, that's another Samoan who uh, who is the brother of the Usos. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing him next week. Well, th- that is some pedigrees for sure. Um, and I do like that they are trying to, in the amount of time they have, only having one show a week, they are doing a lot of coming soon vignettes debuting next week, having some interviews prior to someone getting in the ring. So they are doing uh, an attempt at creating characters for these folks before you see them in the ring. Uh, It's just where there's so many of them sometimes that it's it's hard to maybe differentiate one from the other. Um, I like Cora Jade. I, I don't know what you all think of her. I think she has a lot of potential. She's only 19 years old. So therefore she's, uh, she's kind of, she, not just because she's 19 years old, but I see her very much like the next page. She has that look, that that kind of goth look. Uh, she looked really good in the ring in the, the brief amount of time we've seen her in the ring. And they've started to develop a character for her. If she's there and already on TV at 19, you have to think the sky's the limit probably for her. And um, why I'm on the female side of things, I'll, I'll also mention that uh, uh, toxic attraction are fantastic. I like a faction. And putting the youngsters uh, under the still young herself, Mandy Rose, uh, this is working for me. Lots of charisma. 
Uh, I like Gigi when she was on the Indies. So I think the pieces are all here for, um, they stand out on the show to me as, as a group that, you know, is going. The only thing I don't like about toxic attraction is the fact that Gigi Dolan doesn't get to go solo because I think she's, she's a superstar in the making. Fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. I liked her a lot on the Indies and and I I agree at some point she will be on on her own, but uh, yeah, right now I like what they're doing. Doug, surely I know you don't like Mandy's uh, dark hair. I know you prefer the blonde. So, you know, here's the, here's the thing, you know, I think we have all been like hardcore NXT fans, maybe not the super fan that David is, but we've all been you know, NXT fans. And I find myself since 2.0 launched and maybe slightly before that, I think there's a decline in, in NXT, maybe because of where they were trying to shift things around behind the scenes before they did an official launch or whatever. But, you know, in the months leading up, up to, I would say maybe the month leading up to the 2.0 relaunch, you know, I found it harder and harder to get invested in NXT. And I'm to the point now where, you know, if one of you guys say, hey, you know, you got to check out, you know, Match XYZ that was on NXT, I'm like, okay, cool, I'll check that out. Otherwise, in you know, I watched the show tonight because I knew we were going to talk about it. But, you know, my MO at this point is to catch the, like, you know, the other YouTube shows that do like reviews like day after. And if they're, or, or one of you guys say something. So a lot of the folks are talking about, you know, I'm like, yeah, I don't know this, this soprano guy. And I'm not real, the, the Jade character, I see her tonight. And I'm thinking, is this a Darby Allen gimmick? Is she a skateboarding girl? What, what, what is this? <laughs> you know, toxic attraction I'm familiar with. But, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. I'm just having a hard time getting invested in in this new NXT overall, other than Breaker, which I think, you know, this guy's got a rocket strapped to his back already. But I guess we'll talk about him in a minute. <laughs> I have two others I want to mention to your all's opinion of, because the one that I'm kind of iffy on is Odyssey Jones. I want to like Odyssey Jones, but I don't know that if the idea is that we have an athletic big man um, – that can do things that guys his size shouldn't do. If that's the idea behind the gimmick, then why was that not enough for Bronson Reed? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. it's almost like the same gimmick on a different guy. You're the, you're the guy with the, the big shape and you don't look like you should be able to do the things you can do. It's cool that he can do them, but why him and not Bronson? That's the part I don't get. I agree with that completely. Yeah. I, I, I wish they still had Bronson because mm-hmm. I feel like he would have fit in with this. Point oh, absolutely. And then the other other people I want to mention, because the first time I saw them, I didn't like them. I thought they seemed very uh, lacking in charisma, but they did a re- really good job of, of teaming them, putting them in a larger faction to kind of hide the fact that they're probably learning their mic skills. But I do believe that the Creed brothers have a path uh, for them because, you know, wasn't sure of them at first, but they do work this amateur wrestling gimmick really well in the ring. Uh, they kind of remind me of uh, uh, old school Benjamin Haas, or even, if you want to go even further old school than that, we'll, we'll go back to the Varsity Club. They have that kind of thing. They're they're legit uh, NCAA wrestling athletes. Uh, so what they currently lack in personality, obviously, if the idea behind NXT is we're, we're developmental, that's part of them learning. They're learning in front of us. And part of a faction to cover that up, give them a mouthpiece and a manager like they have right now, I'm fine to watch them develop in the ring because thus far it looks like there might be a way forward for them as well, because they have the look and the pedigree that Vince also likes. Uh, if they can develop that character side of things, I think they got a path. Agree. Anybody else we want to mention that uh, we like, because I'll get to those we don't like, because uh, I know there's one that I think we all three hopefully will agree on. And that's the one that I was, you know, preventing Doug from talking about right off the get <laughs> because I knew that's who he wanted to talk about. As I mean, far as I, new talent, I think we've mentioned the best. And, and saving the best for last, we got a guy who main evented tonight, for those of you that watched, uh, and is main eventing next week, and very likely, if not next week, will very soon be your, very soon. your champion of NXT. Let's talk Braun Breaker. Uh, obviously, the, the, the sky's the limit for him. Uh, he's already considered main event level. Uh, there's no working him up to that level. They already have him at that level as a blue chipper. Uh, for those who don't know, he is the son of Rick Steiner. Uh, though to me, every time he talks, he sounds more like his Uncle Scott. Every time, man. Every time he cuts a I, promo. I keep waiting for him to say, Big Bron Breaker is your hookup. <laughs> Holla, if you hear me. Oh, 
And then the crowd's already got the dog bark for uh, going for him and everything. Uh, I mean, obviously, he. I think we all agree he should be called Steiner. Uh, the fans want him to be Steiner. Mm -hmm. Let him be a Steiner because yes. the kid is. You watch those suplexes. That dude's a Steiner, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where do you all think that uh, Braun Breaker, uh, how soon do you think that he ascends? Do you think that next week he they go ahead and pull the trigger on this? 100%. 100%. He's the next champ. And I, and I honestly, like you mentioned earlier, I don't know how much we see of Champa after he drops the belt. Mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with that. Champa drops the belt. You know, Gargano puts over uh, Carmelo. Um, you know, and maybe they, you know, Gar Gargano goes off, off to be a dad eventually. And who knows where he ends up after that. Maybe behind the scenes, maybe he goes back to the Indies. Champa, same thing with him. But yeah, Champa drops the belt next week to put, puts over Breaker in the best way possible. God, that's a stupid name. Let's just call him a <laughs> Can I just say, can I just say, I really want him to show up to Halloween Havoc in a Michigan Wolverines jacket and the amateur wrestling headgear. Yes. They, they're going to be in, you're going to be in costume anyway, so he needs to do it. Yes. That's fantastic. Yes, that would be that would be perfect for next week. Uh, I agree. It. I think he goes over next week. I'd be very I'd be more shocked if he isn't your new champion at the end of next week. Uh, the question is, how long do you keep him on the brand? Obviously, he's a new face, and you want to keep him there a while to develop. It. He's got the physique. He's got the mic skills already, and the confidence. Um, I don't see a whole lot. Uh, that he's already missing. So what does he have to learn other than maybe just wait his turn and, and use him to build around? That's it. You 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 build your NXT 2.0 around a very fresh face when he defeats this indie indie darling veteran, and you build from there. Yeah, if he's still if he's still on NXT this time next year, I'll be shocked. Mm -hmm. So you think you go a year with him, give him a Goldberg, uh, like, or I guess if they put it in NXT terms, do like an Oscar sort of thing where you have that uh, long reigning champion that just retires, not retires, but relinquishes the belt when they move on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you think that his gimmick is so simple that they can't mess it up if they if he goes to uh, uh, Raw or SmackDown, or do you think they'll put him in Gladiator gear like they're doing Karrion Cross? I want to say they can't mess it up, but it is WWE as much as I, as much as I love NXT, as much as I love WWE, there's nothing they can't mess up if they don't try hard enough. So you, you would just have to wait and see. And that's an so, here's the thing. I, I think you hit on it earlier, David, that, you know, they're building their own because if you look at everybody who NXT that's graduated from NXT to main roster, that WWE is completely screwed up other than Steen or, or Kevin Owens. I can't think of anybody. They really screwed they've successfully pushed on but because they've tried to take what was nxt and then put it to a more general audience like you said earlier and tried to mold it to that and we're like what are you doing with this character like this ridiculous crap they're doing with karen cross now but karen cross isn't a homegrown talent you know keith keith lee isn't a homegrown talent well and all these guys that they failed all these guys that they failed to adequately push are all former indie wrestlers that made a name for themselves before they were even part of WWE. So, I mean, and this was actually something that I meant to bring up uh, when we started talking about the question of identity as to what NXT is, what its purpose is. When we're at, when we're asking the question here on the show is if it, if it's not broke, do you fix it? Was it broke? If the idea is to get main uh, roster talent to Raw and SmackDown, it's worth pointing out that it's not necessarily the fault of NXT that some of these graduates have not fared well. It, just because they groom them well and hand them over to Raw and NXT producers and they completely screw up the gimmicks there, that's not really uh, the broken system part of that isn't on the NXT side, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and I'll even go as far as to say it's not, it's not completely WWE's fault, either the main roster's fault, because even though, yes, they've dropped the ball numerous times, I feel like some of these guys were not going to succeed on the main roster unless you shot them to the moon from the from the get-go. I mean, the, these guys already had such a huge following in the indie scene that they weren't going to sit and wait for a slow build. You had to put them in the heavyweight title scene immediately, or otherwise they're going to feel like they weren't pushed. Well, you have a guy like Karrion Cross who holds your NXT championship for as long as he did, and you job him out on the first night. To the casual wrestling fan, um, 
they're wondering right away, what's the big deal about this guy? I mean, we've already, all we know of him is he's here and he lost rather quickly and uneventfully. And those that know that there's something special there uh, are frustrated at home watching this, but the vast larger number of folks seeing him for the first time don't get what we all get. I still think there's a ton of people out there that don't get what there is special about Keith Lee because they never mm -hmm. saw him on NXT. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Let's talk a little bit about the folks that uh, I know, Doug, you said that there's a lot of nondescripts for you and maybe you haven't uh, seen enough yet uh, engaged with it enough to know who, who isn't working for you at all. But is there any gimmick that you've seen that you absolutely like, okay, that's stupid. I don't like that. You know, I really can't call anything because everything's just so, I don't want to say so vanilla. It's, it's not even vanilla. I'm really just kind of very neutral to nobody is jumping out like breaker is, you know, for, for me anyway, but I, I, I'm indifferent towards the rest of the roster right now. Anybody that you just don't like that they seem intent on making you like? I know there, it's a month, so the, you know, yeah, it's it's pretty early. I mean, there, I can't really say that there's anybody that I just can't stand seeing on on 2.0 right now because it's early, but there are definitely guys that I feel like aren't making the impact that maybe they want to be making. Uh, I don't really get this uh, this Andre Chase guy who's kind of like a foul mouth res wrestling professor or something. Yeah, I don't like that either. Um. Yeah, he's a little weird, and 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 Von Wagner, like he he oh seems God. like he's he seems like he's got a lot of talent, but the, his sloping forehead is just kind of a huge distraction for me. He kind of looks like like somebody grabbed a mallet and just cracked him in the skull, like they do in the cartoons. Like I don't mean to be mean about how anybody looks physically, but there's a reason why in in the in the shot today that he was wearing a hat because he really just completely floats, and it's and it's distracting. So. It is was yeah, absolutely the very first one on my list as well. Um, backstage, along with Braun, he is considered the cream of the crop. Uh, backstage, he's the one that is, is pegged to be, other than Braun, the breakout star. Because like Braun, he is also a second-generation wrestler. Uh, he's the son of Wayne Bloom, who was part of the uh, Beverly Brothers tag team in WWE. Internally, officials are really high on him. I just haven't seen it yet why he's considered to be top of, of the class and why he's being positioned as high as he's been. Whereas for Braun, it seems very natural and, and I'm already taken to him and his character. They're mm -hmm. trying to push uh, Von Wagner similarly. It wasn't his forehead, David, that's distracting me. Um, it's that weird accent. I don't know. It's the, I don't know what that's supposed to be. Uh, he, he's from Minnesota, but he looks like he would, he would be like Eastern European or something, but he's, he's American. Yeah, the accent doesn't sound at all Minnesotan to me. And I don't see the charisma or uh, the ring skills are okay thus far. I just don't see what apparently producers see in him. Uh, I'm also a little lukewarm on the Lash Legend gimmick. Um, Lashing Out is a cute name and all, and I know they're making her a very big part of the show. Uh, she seems to have a lot of confidence, and she plays the character well. Uh, and I don't mean to hate on it just because to be hating on it. I, I actually like the idea of a all of a female led talk show. I mean, you go back to the days of Piper Pitt, the, you know, the Piper's Pitt, the whole idea of the show within a show has all been male hosted. So the idea that you'd have a female segment like that is fantastic. Um, but I don't know that the gossip show angle that they're taking it from is going to amount to anything well it looks like she's at an open mic or something and there's a whole bunch of people just like cracking up like she's a stand-up comedian it's all it's all very kind of cringy yeah and i'm and i'm just a little bit concerned that she's been on like every single episode since nxt debut nxt 2.0 debuted but she hasn't had a match yet like she's been featured prominently on every episode but no match so i can't help but wonder is she that bad in the ring that they're kind of holding off or that's a good point. It could be like the opposite of the Creed Brothers, where the in-ring work is there, but we're going to pair you with uh, Diamond Mine so that you have a stable and a mouthpiece. For her, it may be let's establish the gimmick and let her do her talking while she's actually doing her learning uh, at the Performance Center off camera. That could very well be it. Eventually, though, it has to lead to matches. If they're going to feature you so prominently, uh, there has to be a payoff. Uh, at some point where, you know, you're getting a feud and, and, and you get in the ring. But uh, we appear, at least with uh, Lash, to be way, way off uh, before that happens. Gentlemen, let's bottom line it here. 
end of the day, it's only been a month. Uh, we all kind of agree that uh, even though we loved NXT as it was, didn't necessarily want or need a 2.0. Um, I'll go first. Then just bottom line it for me. Um, I think that it's turned out better than I expected it to. Uh, I thought it was going to be a total disaster when I heard that they were taking my my favorite toy and, and going to break it unnecessarily. I thought that this is just the enemy enjoying NXT. Uh, to me, the main problem is it's just too much too soon. And, you know, with AEW, when they first started, I knew some of the big names that they had that they built around. But so much of that roster was new to me that it actually took me a while to learn who people were. So I'm willing to give time to actually like learn about some of these characters, even though many of them are obviously a lot more raw. Um, it's right now just a little hard to do when there's so many that I still am finding it overwhelming to invest in a character when there's so many of them that I'm trying to learn. I, I'm still getting names mixed up, quite honestly. Uh, but all that said, I'm tentatively optimistic that it's at least going in a direction that I can can invest in because they have some folks there that have already caught my eye and they didn't break it too bad. They shook it up a whole lot, but they didn't actually like destroy my love of NXT, which is what I was uh, determined to, to feel at the end of the day when I heard that they were doing all of this. Um, Doug, what do you think? What's your bottom line on NXT 2.0? I'm not sure who, who NXT 2.0 is for. I don't think it's for guys like us anymore. I think the original NXT was for us. This NXT 2.0, I, I, I'm not sure it's for us. I mean, we're going to watch it. We're going to consume it. I'm not sure who it's for, though. I don't, again, I don't think it's for me. <laughs> It's a question of identity, right? It's a, you know, yeah. what, what is the show supposed to be and, and who is it I connecting mean, with? I mean, I do I do think that, you know, it, it, it is here to grow those stars like, like Dave was talking about. You know, they grow those stars and maybe bring in a, young, a much younger audience uh, and, and try and build from there with, you know, some of these gimmicks that we just don't get. Like, you know, may, maybe the kids today love this, like, lashing out, you know, like talk show gimmick and maybe, you know. <laughs> I don't know. It may not be targeted at us. That's a that's a good you know, fair point. And you know, maybe maybe with that, you know, this Leo Rush thing, where it's like, okay, we're just gonna let you talk. You're an amazing wrestler, but we're not gonna let you wrestle because that's kind of what WWE does. I mean, we had Leo Rush as a mouthpiece for Bobby Lashley instead of letting him wrestle, and we all know he can go. So, of course, you know, AEW is doing the same thing right now. But <laughs> I wasn't gonna call you on that one, Dynamite. Hey, I, I, I got to call it down the middle, man. David, what do you think? Uh, bottom line, NXT 2.0. Like it, don't like it? Somewhere I, I, think, I think there's no denying that NXT 1.0 was a better show than NXT 2.0 for hardcore fans like me, you, and Doug. There's no denying it. I think short term, it's probably not the best thing for them. But I think long term, this might be exactly what they needed. And I think we could be looking back on this in three, four, five years and saying they did this at just the right time. Because if, the if I mean, that's a big if, but if they can successfully develop these guys to be WWE stars of tomorrow, which WWE hasn't really had a whole lot of lately, yeah, true. It, it could be the best thing for them. And it could be the one thing that sets them apart from the competition like AEW. You know, and in a lot of ways, it's also been what's uh, helped uh, the indie scene and Ring of Honor. I mean, WWE's loss, their excess baggage, as it were, has benefited the world of professional wrestling and your average fan because this talent that didn't have anywhere to, else maybe to go or develop have, have blossomed for the most part in other realms of the wrestling world. Uh, as for NXT itself, uh, if it is to produce the talents of tomorrow and ends up doing that at a much cheaper cost for WWE, then it's a smart business decision. Uh, for them, it's not losing anything in the ratings thus far. It's still holding steady. So it's not like they uh, completely alienated their audience. So someone's tuning in. Um, and, and to the same degree, if you can get the same ratings at a, at a less cost than uh, business wise. Yeah. It's not the glory days of NXT, but there's no reason for me to think that they can't get there. I, I'd still love for Triple H to be running the show. Yeah. I don't know if that's going to happen, but I, I, you know, time will tell. But I really think in a few years, this this decision is going to be looked at as something that, I mean, it could be a train wreck or it could be something that will be hugely successful for WWE. Only time will tell. 
as you said, time will tell and the patience of those doing the uh, the rebooting <laughs> so that they hopefully don't give us 3.0 way too fast. Hopefully they have the patience to let it mature, right? And with that, that is our main event topic for tonight. David, thank you for joining us. Will you stick with us to the big finish? Will you sure thing. Will you with us for a few minutes more? Uh, big finish, folks. If this is the first time you're watching the Two Bros Wrestling Show, this is when we give you the one, two, three, the botch of the week, the performance of the week, the match of the week. We have three bros here tonight. Uh, we, we've we've uh, upped the amount of bros for this special broadcast. I'm going to start botch of the week. For me, John Moxley versus Nick Gage for the GCW Championship. I watched it. I don't. I can't say that I was overly familiar with Game Changer Wrestling, but I, I was interested in this contest. And it, it kept my attention. It was entertaining. So from all of those points of view, I cannot deny that uh, I was sucked in the way that uh, I'm sure they wanted the pay-per-view audience to be sucked in. At the same time, man, you have a beautiful, talented wife at home and a brand new baby. And why in the world when you're a major star on AEW and over in New Japan, would you sit there and let a maniac like Nick Gage uh, take a pizza cutter and just carve you to pieces. I mean, God love John Moxley for the way he obviously loves that style of wrestling in the business. And, and you had Mick Foley at ringside calling the, uh, calling the action on, on the mic. So it, the presentation was all there. I know different strokes for different folks. It's not my style of wrestling, but he's one of those that doesn't need to be doing it. And it, it did make me cringe the whole time watching it, just watching him do that to his body, knowing what all he has going on in his life and that he doesn't need to be doing it. Time out, we'll we'll go to you. We'll so, go last on a botch. So uh, uh, for botch, you know, this past this past Friday night, you had Minoru, uh, legendary New Japan wrestler Minoru Suzuki and the American Dragon for free on YouTube. Oh. <laughs> you know that that is a that was a paper. I mean, you know, they just gave away the house there on that one. You know, that, that could have been so much more, I get why they did it, but you know, that could have been so, that, that could have been so much of a draw. And again, I get that. I get why they did it like that, but. You think that's an overreaction to WWE? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, like I said, you know, if, if WWE had done something like this, I would call them out. So I've got to call out, I've got to call out Mr. Khan on this one. <laughs> Little hot shot booking by AEW. That's, uh, and Doug call him out on it too. That's even, it's a double rarity. Yeah, you know, I, I don't, I, there. I don't know what the, uh, costume is that Doug's got, Doug's got a gimmick he's trying to work. It looks like he's cuddling Frankie Monet's dog or something. I'm not sure what's going on. It's a blanket. I'm cold. I'm slightly symptomatic tonight. First you thought it was a Santa beard, and then like, yeah. Dave, we'll go to you. Watch of the week. Um, you know, I, I looked real hard for a botch of the week, and, and, and honestly, the closest thing I could find to a botch was in a match that was actually, I thought, very, very good. But I was watching uh, Malachi Black versus Dante Martin on uh, AW, and at one point there there was black all over Dante Martin's face. But I hadn't seen him shoot any mist. I hadn't seen Black do the black mist. And then at one point he had Martin in a single leg crab, and then he just kind of ke keeled over. Um, CM Punk said maybe it had something to do with the black mist. So I don't know if he swallowed something. But something was definitely off. So I, I thought that was maybe kind of a botch that wasn't supposed to happen that way. It seemed odd. But you it, mentioning it, Punk made me think that uh, there was a botch on Rampage, too, that involved him uh, this past week. Uh, he kind of gave away, uh, I think, before he – it wasn't quite the Bobby Heenan uh, calling Hulk Hogan uh, coming out from the NWO going, whose side is he on? We all knew it was FTR under those masks, but I don't think that CM Punk was supposed to reveal it on the microphone because Tony Schiavone and JR seemed truly shocked that they <laughs> – it, they looked like idiots that they didn't notice what was obvious to everyone, apparently obvious to CM Punk. So they they were kind of caught with their pants down, I think. <laughs> uh, performance of the week. Um, Doug, we'll start with you. So here's where I redeem myself with AEW a little bit, but Tony <laughs> Khan. <laughs> I, I don't know if you guys saw this news story where Khan, uh, Tony is at uh, – the sports ball game for whatever team he owns in Jack or his dad owns, but you know, he's, he's ring, not ringside. 
sports field yeah, he's side, a, sidelines. He's on the sidelines, side lines, right? He's football <laughs> sidelines, yes. Yeah, football. And he's got the he's got the uh, a playbook or clipboard or something, and <laughs> you can see the card for full gear. You know, he's holding it. You can see the card for full gear, right? Yeah. But I don't I don't call this a botch. I, I I'm calling him out, you know, for being you know the performer of the week because Tony. Is a very business savvy, a very media savvy person. Now, everybody, everybody in every news outlet that covers wrestling has been talking about this. People have zoomed and enhanced and found the card down to a point where you know, it looks like certain names are circled and then those are the presumed winners. But really, at the end of the day, I think he's too smart to do that. I think he's working us all and <laughs> we're all talking about it. So, you know, he claims, he claims it wasn't intentional, but, but. Yeah, he's pretty shrewd, and and we're all talking about it. Yeah. So, hey, what about you, your performance per, per, performance of the week, or per, you said performer? Performance or performer? Yeah. I don't. I don't know. I don't know if this qualifies as performance, but um, and Doug's probably going to be shocked because this is going to be the second AEW shout out I'm giving. But uh, but I've chuckled more than once this week at the Elite or Omega or whatever, what have you. I love the spot they did. Um, this week, I think it was on Dynamite, might have been Rampage, I'm not sure, when uh, they were facing the Dark Order, and the Dark Order did the double kiss on Adam Cole. Mm -hmm. That one had me chuckling tight a little bit, and then there was also a moment, uh, I, I think it might have been in the same event, where uh, they attacked uh, Luchasaurus, and Omega just kept going, um, we... We kicked your friend in his beanbag. We kicked your friend in his beanbag. And I, I don't know why, but that just had me laughing. It had me dying. <laughs> no, that's good. Maybe that's the immature side of me, but I was I was chuckling quite a bit. Uh, no, Kenny is hilarious. No, that's fantastic. I actually didn't catch him saying that. I did catch the, the, the kiss spot as, as something that cracked me up big time, too. Uh, my performer of the week, I'm going out of the big uh, the big guys. Uh, I'm calling out Alex uh, Alexander Hammerstone the new MLW uh, heavyweight champion. Um, I think he's the right man and, and put on a heck of a performance. They did their fight land uh, show, which is the biggest show for MLW in its history because it was broadcast on vice, which is the home of dark side of the ring. Dark side of the ring is the uh, highest rated show on vice. So they would actually have a wrestling show, a wrestling special. Not sure if this was a pilot, a one-off, uh, what have you, but obviously because of the importance and the number of eyes that were on it, it's the most important show in MLW's history. Uh, it did pretty well in the ratings. It was two years in the making. They held off two years and showed that kind of patience where you had Jacob Fatu as the champion hold his belt for two years, going up against Hammerstone, who had held uh, the open weight championship for two years, title versus title, winner take all. Uh, they promoted it as the biggest match in history. It felt like a big match. And, and, Hammerstone even uh, messed up his ankle, thought it was broken early on in the match and finished the contest. So uh, kudos to him uh, for an incredible performance. Obviously, it is meant to be the face of the promotion as they go into their next phase of trying to uh, to lend themselves a, a, maybe a full time uh, deal with a, a network like Vice or a streaming service. So kudos to him. And then we'll finally move on to our uh, match of the week. Dave, I want to throw this one to you first. Um, you know, most of the week I thought my match of the week was actually going to be on NXT UK. I watched uh, Ilya Dragunov versus A Kid, which was a great match. It wasn't it wasn't quite the level of Dragunov versus Walter, but it was still still a hell hell of a match. Um, but I think in the end, I decided to go with SmackDown and their tag team street fight between um, the Street Profits and the Usos. I, I, I love that match. There was so many great spots in it. And, and you know, we were mentioning homegrown talent before. If, if Montez Ford isn't a, a, a superstar in this industry in the years to come, I don't know who is. He's yeah. just something else. And yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, and that's no offense. Uh, that's no offense to the Street Province as a team. But somebody's got to be the Marty Jannetty, and it's not going to be Montez. Sorry, Dawkins. <laughs> Uh, no, that was a, a great contest. They had great chemistry together. Um, anyway, I love watching them. Uh, they were one of my favorite matches a couple of weeks ago at the pay-per-view I got to attend. Uh, Doug, how about you? What, what stood out to you on AEW? I mean, in wrestling this week. <laughs> well, you should mention AEW because my watch of the week 
you know, it's a box because they gave it away for free, but it's also the match of the week when you have a, two legends like this, Minoru Suzuki and the American Dragon, you know, Brian Daniels. You, you, you have these two going at it, just beating the crap out of each other for 20 minutes for free. And I can go back and watch it anytime now on YouTube. I mean, yeah, you know, although I, I don't like the Suzuki. Every, every match he's had in AEW, he's lost. But, yeah, I do not he's like really, that. He's special. He needs to be protected a little bit more than that. Just a little bit. I mean, this man is a legend. But, you know, uh, this this match was just brutal. Not brutal like, you know, Moxley, you know, one of those, like, hardcore Moxley-type matches. <laughs> that's, that's a whole other level of brutal, especially when you bring out my new favorite uh, hardcore weapon, the pizza cutter. But... <laughs> But this was a, a just a, I mean, I was entertained. Uh, I think, you know, it, it was a hot shot booking and it was a knee jerk reaction to, uh, to go head to head to try and drive people to it. But it was still a great match. If, if, go on YouTube and watch it. I'm if you're have to, it I, actually, I actually missed it. So I'm glad that you brought that up as your match of the week. I'll go check it out for sure. Uh, especially with both those talents involved uh, for me, match of the week. Uh, for the longest time, I thought that I was going to be going, like you said, David, uh, with the with the NXT UK, which I guess now is the black and gold brand <laughs> still <laughs> in WWE. Uh, but that yeah, that match was fantastic. Uh, but I, I've decided to go with uh, actually sort of a, a, a combo here, uh, just WWE sort of flexing on everybody a little bit. Um, the last couple of days, they really showed off uh, just how superior their women's division is. And, uh, you know, for all the slack we can throw at WWE, for the many things they do wrong, they headlined both SmackDown, uh, the one that went head-to-head -head with AEW. Uh, then they also headlined Raw, uh, featuring their top female talent. And they, of course, delivered. Uh, Sasha versus Becky on Friday. And then, I guess, to, you know, after they tore the roof off the place to, to not be outdone, uh, Bianca and Flair last night gave another uh, performance that would have been worthy on a pay-per-view outside of the mm -hmm. finish. Uh, so in both of those instances, it was just sort of WWE, I think, flexing a little bit about like we have the top women's talent in the world and we can put them in the main event of both of our main shows and 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 do good numbers. So uh, and and both did deliver. And, and I want to see more of that. So, uh, yes, Becky and uh, Becky, Bianca, Flair, Sasha, uh, still cream of the crop. And with that, gentlemen. It has been a very fun edition. Uh, yeah, and thank you, folks, for tuning in on a on a Tuesday night. We're going to be back on Sunday uh, for our regular show. And Doug, you'll love this topic because we're talking AEW. Uh, and but Dude, we're looking at it. T-shirt company, right? The AEW, the little T-shirt company. <laughs> <laughs> if they're a t-shirt company, you're keeping them in business, my friend. Uh, we'll get <laughs> I, I even wore a property of you know, Performance Center tonight. <laughs> That's right. You're thematic. Well, I'm sure you'll have an AEW shirt on for a Sunday show because we're looking at AEW as a critical and rating success as it is. Is it financially successful? This is a little more of a mystery. We know that it's ran by a billionaire with limitless resources that he dumps into, uh, you know, making the product. Uh, uh, what it is, taking, stealing talent away from everyone else, kind of reminds us a little bit of another billionaire story, and we all know how that one ended. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're going to look more at the business side of AEW and uh, maybe a little bit of that part that we don't hear as much about, and that is the business side. And uh, join us on Sunday at our regular night and time. Uh, but for now, David, thank you so much for joining us and being the third bro tonight. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you. We'll have to do this again. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And uh, Kevin, that check that I promised you is in the mail. <laughs> <laughs> if it's not Tony Khan size the way that Doug gets, I will uh, I will I will let you know. <laughs> Thank you guys. I, I had a lot of fun. Thank you for having me on. Thanks, man. This is great. Thank you guys for joining us too. Thanks for everybody for watching. Stay safe.